Good morning and welcome to Bethel Church. If you have your Bibles or your apps today, uh, go ahead and turn to John chapter 10. We're going to pick up there in just a moment. Today we're going to talk about living a life full on. And uh, while you're doing that, I just want to say good morning to anyone who is joining us online today. We're sure glad that you've joined us for church. Uh, and wherever you are at, you can call Bethel home in this moment. Uh, thank you for being with us as we preach the word. Well, if you're new to Bethel Church this morning, let me echo the welcome from our lead pastor, Pastor Tom Van Kempen, and say we are very happy that you're here. We hope that you'll find this a place that you'll call home and that you'll enjoy here at Bethel Church with us. Get to know us a little more after service. Come talk to any one of us in a uh, nice gray shirt here uh, or one of our pastoral staff, and we would just love to get to know you a little bit more. And uh, while I'm doing that, let me also say thank you to Pastor Tom for sharing the pulpit with me today. It is really a great honor to be able to preach at a great church. And frankly, it's just a privilege to be in a great church where you're sitting right now is a great time to be involved in the life of Bethel Church. Pastor Tom mentioned earlier, yeah, let's go ahead and just give the Lord some praise for what he's doing. It's okay to be enthusiastic in church, all right? So like anytime you want to clap or say amen today, you just have permission now, all right? That'll just, that'll fuel the fire. You'll get a little more, you'll get a little more bang for your buck out of me if you do that. You can kind of like crank up how the preacher goes, you know? So there's a lot to celebrate uh, around here right now. We just went through Grow Track, a one-day event that is a precursor for something we're going to start in October every single Sunday. And so if you missed our one-day event yesterday, that's okay. Well, you can come through Grow Track starting in October, as Pastor Tom mentioned earlier. Uh, that's going to be here on the San Jose campus at 11 every Sunday starting in October, and on the Santa Clara campus at 9.15 every Sunday starting in October. So yeah, see, thank you. I appreciate that. I feel the fire burning inside of me. Another reason to be excited about what's going on at Bethel Church is today we launch, uh, for the next two weeks, we launch our life groups here at Bethel Church. And we're going to talk more about that uh, all through uh, the sermon today. But life groups are a place where we're going to get to do life together as a church, where you get to study the word together with people and live together with them. You get to share life with someone else. And so we're really excited about that today. And finally, coming up in just two weeks, on September 10th, uh, it's called Vision Sundays. And so we're going to have a series of Sundays, uh, and they're going to be called 2020. And uh, Pastor Tom is going to be leading us in vision. You may be saying, what's the direction of the church? What's going on at Bethel? Where are we going with all of this? Well, come on September 10th. You may kind of still be in vacation mode. You may be busy because you're starting school. Uh, you might be staying up late uh, because you're doing homework. Well, let me just say this. Uh, pack up a little bit early and come home from vacation. Do your homework a little bit earlier or make sure your kids do their homework. Not late Saturday night, maybe a little earlier. Go to bed and then come on Sunday morning. Don't miss September 10th and the Sundays after that. It is going to be an amazing time at Bethel Church. So it's an exciting time to be here. I mean, Bethel is just a great place and God is doing a great thing. And we as a staff, we pray this often, that you would feel this with us, a contagious enthusiasm for what God is doing, for how he is drawing us near to him, for the greater things that he is preparing us for. And it's our prayer that you'd feel that with us, that you would have faith rise up in your hearts and you'd be excited for what is going on at Bethel Church. And so I'd like you to look with me now to John 10.10 10 as we start the message today. And we're going to read first in the ESV and then we're going to look at it in the message as well. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and they may have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. Now look at the way this reads in the message. A thief is only there to steal and kill and destroy. I came so that they may have real and eternal life, more and better than they've ever dreamed of. I am the good shepherd. Would you pray with me this morning? Lord, thank you for your word. And as we, as we open the Bible, as we read what it says, as we listen, would you reveal in our hearts your truth? As scripture says about itself, that the word of God is alive and active, a two-edged sword. And so God, today we pray that you would bring to life your word, that you would bring to life your truth, that you would teach us as we grow closer to you. In your name we pray these things, amen. Well, the title of today's message is Full on, life full on. And the reason I'm going with that, I know that's not what it says in both of those translations, but when I traveled to Australia about 20 years ago and uh, I heard a lot of Australians saying this saying, they'd say full on. And it was kind of to communicate 
that they were fully into something, that it was full of life and vibrancy, that they were excited about it. It's an all-in kind of attitude. And they would say, yeah, full on, mate, full on. So just turn to your neighbor right now and in your best crocodile Dundee, give them full on, mate. Go ahead, say it out. Say full on, mate. <laughs> yeah, full on. Roid on, Aussies. So if you're from Australia or you're watching online right now, we didn't mean to offend you. I just love Crocodile Dundee. I just, I grew up with those movies and that, you know, he pulls the, the antenna off the limo and throws it like a boomerang and takes the guy out. I mean, just, you know, he's a man's man. That's not a knife. This is a knife, you know? Anybody, anybody with me? Someone goes, no. Yeah, go watch it then. Don't be a party pooper. So today we're going to look at Jesus Christ as the good shepherd and what he wants in our lives, in this life and in the next, and what it means when he says, I want you to have life to the full. So when you think of a full life, what comes to mind? Is it happiness? Is it riches? Is it security? Is it your 401k? Is it to just have fun? Is it to have a great Instagram account? Is it to have the perfect family? Now, there's a story of a village fisherman, and he meets a vacationing businessman. The American businessman was on holiday in a fishing village in the south of Mexico. And one morning, he met a young fisherman with a small boat full of beautiful yellowfin tuna. What beautiful tuna, the businessman exclaimed. How long did it take you to catch them, he asked. Oh, about four hours, said the fisherman. Well, why didn't you fish for longer, and, and why didn't you catch more? And the fisherman replied, well, I, I didn't want to fish any longer. With this, I have enough fish to feed my family. Well, what do you do with the rest of your day? Aren't, aren't you bored? And the fisherman replied, oh, I'm never bored. I get up late in the morning. I play with my children. I watch football. I take a siesta with my wife. Sometimes in the evenings, I walk to the village to see my friends, and I play guitar, and I sing songs. And the businessman just couldn't wrap his head around this. And he said, look, I'm a very successful businessman. I went to Stanford University. I have multiple degrees in business. I can help you. Here's what you do. You fish for eight hours, not four. And then you sell the extra fish that you catch. Then you can buy a bigger boat. And then you keep doing this and you can buy another boat. And go ahead and buy a third and a fourth boat. Soon you'll have a fleet of boats. And, and then you can export this fish. You can leave this fishing village. You can go to Mexico City. You can go to New York. You can go to LA, wherever you want. And you can open a fishing business. And the fisherman smiled and said, how long will this take? And the businessman thought about it for a bit. And then he said, oh, probably 15 to, to 20 years. And then what, asked the fisherman. Well, that's the exciting part, laughed the businessman. You can then sell your business, and you can become rich, a millionaire even. A millionaire? Really? But what do I do with all the money? And the young fisherman didn't look excited at this point, so the businessman was a little perplexed. And he said, well, I guess you could work hard. You could sell the business. Then you could move to a lovely old fishing village where you can sleep late, play with your grandchildren, watch football, take a siesta with your wife, walk in the village in the evenings and play guitar and hang out with your friends. Well, all of us have different ideas, right, about what a fulfilled life looks like. And whatever that idea is, it tends to be the thing that is driving us to constantly do something to reach that point of fulfillment. But as we read scripture, we discover that Jesus' idea of the fulfilled life, the full life, is different than ours. Now, to understand this passage better, we really need to understand the context in which uh, life to the full is being presented. And to do that, we have to understand the Good Shepherd. And this is really where life begins, with the Good Shepherd, with Jesus Christ. In fact, the whole front of this chapter, verses 1 through 18, uh, is all about the Good Shepherd. Jesus compares himself to a shepherd who is taking care of sheep. And not just any shepherd. He says he is the good sh shepherd. So not even a good, but the best, the one. One that truly loves his sheep. One that sacrifices for his sheep. He says he lays down his life for his sheep. He said he protects his sheep. He gives them life that is full. And knowing the shepherd helps you understand why he does what he does and how the sheep benefit from it. Likewise, knowing Jesus is the key to life full on. Amen. And as chapter 10 begins, we find that this is a very warm and very encouraging 
and, and very personal set of scriptures that God uses to reveal how he wants to relate to us and how he wants us to relate to him. In fact, all through scripture, we see this analogy of human beings being compared to sheep. It's all through the Old Testament. If you look, for instance, in Isaiah, you see in 53, uh, uh, verse 6, he says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And, and perhaps one of the most famous scriptures that many of you will know and be familiar with would be Psalm 23, 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures, right? He leads me beside still waters. Many of you could even quote the rest of that scripture. But the idea there is that there is a comparison between how the shepherd takes care of the sheep and how we are like sheep and God takes care of us. The analogy is clear in our relationship with the Lord. So now in John 10, Jesus kind of takes it a step further. They would have had an understanding that this was an Old Testament teaching as they listened. And then Jesus says, guess what? You know who the good shepherd is? It's me. I'm standing right here. All this time you've been waiting to meet the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. And now some of this uh, shepherding stuff might be lost on us, especially in in Western culture where many of us are not shepherds, right? We don't have a lot of sheep. Uh, Maybe you grew up uh, in the East Bay, like I grew up in Concord, and over in Antioch there were some guys that had sheep, but not a ton. So for most of us, probably not the case, right? Um, And especially in like a big metro area, there's not a lot of shepherding going on around here, so we may not have uh, a point of reference. But just go with me for a moment. I mean, imagine that, if you will. What would it be like if there were sheep? I mean, leave San Jose the same, leave Santa Clara the same, and just add sheep, right? Lots of sheep. Things would look really different, wouldn't they? Right? Like traffic jams would look totally different. We'd call them traffic lambs. And, uh, (laughs) right? Yeah. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. That one took me a long time to write. Um, I'm not the brightest. Uh, So it'd be different, right? The police would carry shepherd's crooks. You think your street stinks now? Well, put 100 sheep on there. It would all be different. Well, as Jesus was speaking his message to the disciples and followers, there would have been a different understanding. They, They would have understood what it meant to be a shepherd, to have sheep, to care for them and to watch over them. And it would have been for most people in that day that they lived in a small village, and there would have been... Uh, a lot of sheep around. There would have been livestock, there would have been uh, fruit and vegetables being grown, an agrarian kind of society, Uh, and so they would understand what it means to be a shepherd. And so let's just take a look at that for a moment so we get familiar. Uh, There'd be many flocks of sheep in a given village, and don't think like large industrial uh, complex with rows of uh, flocks of sheep and shepherds in each. Uh, No, think just kind of one big pen, and it's called a sheepfold. And in the sheepfold, all the sheep are there for the village. They've grown up there. Uh, that's that's kind of where they live most of the time before they go out to pasture. And so when the shepherd has to go and get his sheep, the ones that he owns or the ones that he is the caretaker for, he goes in to bring them out of the pen and into pasture. And when he does that, he separates them in a unique way. It's not by branding. Uh, it's not by some complicated system. Uh, instead, he goes in. And because he knows the sheep, he's raised them since they were little ewes. Uh, And they know him because their whole lives, all they've known is this shepherd, their caretaker. And so he knows them and they know him. And he would go in and he would call them, sometimes even by name. Some shepherds would name their sheep. And as they speak, the sheep know the tone and the sound and the name. And so they start following that shepherd. It's very unique. And when they were out to pasture, they would often be out for weeks at a time. And so the shepherd would bring them out to the fields. They'd be in the hills. They'd be eating and getting full and fat and getting all their wool and getting ready for being sheared. The sheep got to love that, by the way, right? You ever seen a sheared sheep? It's like, that's got to be so embarrassing. You know, like he's all kind of majestic and fluffy. And then like a couple moments later, nothing, you know, just pink, naked sheep. Uh, But the sheep are out in the pasture and they'd have to find some place to protect them. So they would find a place with some rocks, some crags, uh, maybe build a little bit of a fence structure. And then there'd be one opening. And at night, the shepherd or shepherds would take shifts and they would lay down in that opening. And that's how they'd protect the sheep from wandering off and getting hurt or from predators coming in and eating and killing the sheep. So this then is the backdrop that Jesus is speaking to. 
As he speaks, everyone has this understanding. Oh yeah, I kind of get what being a shepherd and a sheep is all about. So I wanted to put that in our minds for some familiarity. And as you remember that, let's look at some big ideas about how a shepherd loves his sheep and makes their lives full. How does Jesus make life so full? The first thought is this. He knows us and he wants to be close to us. So if you're taking notes, write down that he knows us and he wants to be close to us. Remember that the shepherd would come into the pen and separate his sheep from the rest with the personal relationship. He would call them by voice and they would know his voice. The shepherd comes in and he has one desire to shepherd the sheep, to lead them, to know them. Uh, if you are in John 10 still and you look back up a few verses at verse 2, he who enters the door is the sh uh, shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. Boy, that verse reads a little differently now, doesn't it? With a little bit of context. The Lord knows those who are his and he has a desire to be close to them. Let's personalize that. You need to know that God loves you. And whether you know him or not, he wants to be close to you. He wants to care for you. He wants to love you. He wants to provide for you. His desire is not nefarious like the thief or the wolf that is mentioned in other parts of this scripture. No, he has your best interest in mind, and he wants you to know today that you are loved. And this is the kind of God that we have, not the kind of God that you have to impress, not the kind of God that you have to do something to get his attention, not the kind of God that you have to do a bunch of works for, but the kind of God that comes into the sheepfold. He comes into the sphere of your life, right where you're at, and he calls you by name, and he wants to be close to you, and he wants to have relationship with you. He wants to give you, as Jesus says, life to the full. A second thought is this. How does Jesus make life so full? He guards us from the thief and the destroyer. Five times in this passage, Jesus mentions either the thief, the robber, the wolf, and, and that is the devil, right? One of the unfortunate realities of this life is that there is an enemy to us all. He does not have your best interests in mind. He does not love you. He does not think of you. The only thing he thinks of is the longing for your destruction. And his name is the devil or Satan. And look, I don't say that to scare you or to be dramatic this morning, but to tell you the truth, that there is an enemy to your soul. And one of the contrasts that Jesus makes in this scripture is that on the one hand, there is the thief and the robber, the enemy. And on the other hand, there is the good shepherd. Look how much the good shepherd loves you. Look how much better it is to know the good shepherd than to be susceptible to the enemy. Jesus says that like the shepherd, he lays down at the gate. Remember the little gate, the only opening to the sheep. And remember that the shepherd, he lays there, he guards them, not only from running away and getting lost, which sheep do, and that's because sheep are stupid, all right? Uh, sheep are dumb animals. They're known for being dumb animals. And I know that doesn't make you feel good about being compared to a sheep, all right? So I'm not calling you that this morning, but let's just say for the sake of argument, the analogy is sometimes sheep do some dumb stuff on their own. And can we all agree that sometimes we've done some dumb stuff on our own, all right? So you can see where that comes together. But he guards the sheep not only from themselves, but also from the outside attacker. Who remembers the old Disney short cartoons, eight minutes long, and it's called Lambert the Sheepish Lion? Anybody? Anybody remember that? Lambert the Sheepish I see a few hands like kind of a little bit going up there. Well, I'll educate the rest of you who, who don't know this old Disney cartoon. It's a, it's a little cartoon, and it's a little, uh, little lion, and he's raised by sheep. And the whole thing starts off, and there's this little song, right? Every good Disney movie has a song, right? And before there was Let It Go, there was Lambert the sheepish lion Lambert was always trying to be a wild and woolly sheep. Does anyone know the rest? Lambert the sheepish lion. Yeah, some of you are getting it now, right? When you start to sing it, you're like, oh yeah, I do remember seeing that. You're cool, Matt. I get you. <laughs> so Lambert the sheepish lion, he's raised by sheep. So he grows to this huge lion, but he's very sheepish. He's very afraid. 
all right? And his mom's always calling him, Lambert, Lambert, right? She's a sheep. That's how she'd talk, right? It makes sense. And so at the end of the story, a wolf comes in and takes Lambert's mom, the sheep that had raised him. And on the edge of a cliff, she's cornered, very dramatic, Disney fashion, right? There's like lightning in the background. And so the wolf's about to eat her, right? And Lambert is still afraid. He's over in the other corner, and he's quivering with his mane. And then all of a sudden, something snaps in him, the narrator says, and he becomes the fierce lion that he was meant to be. He runs up, he chases the wolf. The wolf runs in fear, and then Lambert pushes the wolf off a cliff. So like, <laughs> it was, it's like, whoa, Disney, hi-oh, you know? I guess it's better than watching the lion like devour the wolf for the kids in the cartoon, that'd be bad. So the wolf falls off the cliff, and Lambert saves the day. Everybody's happy. And there's one thing that Jesus is not. He is not sheepish. But there's one thing in Scripture, more than one thing, one thing, though, that Scripture says he is, is that he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And he is not sheepish. He roars with power. He protects you. He stands between you and the wolf. He takes on the enemy so that we don't have to. He fights battles so that you don't have to. He lays down in front of the one gate that lets the enemy into your life, and he stands there and protects you. Praise God for Jesus Christ, the good shepherd. We don't have to be afraid of the enemy of our soul because Jesus Christ stands at the gate, is what the scripture says, and he guards us and he protects us. And that's one of the things that makes a life with Jesus so full is you have a protector. Amen. A third thought is this. He only wants the best for us. How does Jesus make life so full? He only wants the best for us. What is the shepherd looking to do? He wants to take the sheep out of the pen and into the pasture where things are good, where food is plentiful, where there is freedom to roam and to run, where there is life. And God is a God who wants to do good for you. In fact, Scripture says that he roams to and fro throughout the earth looking for someone who is fully devoted to him so that he would do good to them. What a great Scripture, right? That he's actually looking intentionally to find someone who is full on for him and that he will do good to you. He's not a God that just let the universe like play itself out you know, you've ever heard that? Yeah, okay, maybe I believe God created the universe and then he just kind of let it go. That's not true. God created the universe and it, Scripture says that he holds it in his hand. Scripture says that he controls it all. And in the midst of all that, he loves you so much that he's looking to do good for you and to you. He only wants the best for us. He doesn't just want an okay life, the, but the best life. In John 10, 9, now if you just go down a few verses in John 10, he says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The idea here is there, there is salvation with Jesus Christ for eternal life and that there is a full life with Jesus in this temporal human life. Now we get both. And salvation is really the starting point for a life full on. You see, we begin to follow Jesus at salvation, and then we keep following him with a fulfilled life. Whatever he has for us and wherever he leads, that is the best. That is the best place to be. So what does the full-on life look like? Let me share three thoughts with you. Life is full-on with Jesus, first and foremost. Life is full-on with Jesus. Look again at John 10.10, 10, and look at it this time in the message. I came so that they can have real and eternal life, more and better life than they've ever dreamed of. I mean, that's a pretty big claim, right? More than you can dream of, more and better, but it's true. And this is the first and most important part of a full-on life, a relationship with Jesus Christ. This is where real life begins. It's not about being religious. It's not about a program at church. It's not about a way of doing things. None of those things make your life full. It's not about what you know, but the full-on life, rather, is about who you know. And it starts with a relationship with Jesus Christ. And one of the things that Jesus is contrasting here in chapter 10 is actually something that happened in chapter 9, just previous to this. 
all right? And it was the bad leadership of the religious rulers at the time. So what happens is Jesus heals a man who was born blind, all right? So from birth, Scripture says um, that he was blind. And Jesus heals him on the Sabbath. And so the religious rulers are so upset about the fact that Jesus healed him, that he bent down and he made mud on the Sabbath to heal this man, that they totally ignore the fact that this man just had a miracle in his life. I mean, what would a normal, kind, loving person do? Like, imagine your friend is blind from birth and they're healed. What are you going to do? You're like, yes, it was God. That's awesome. Wow, amazing. It's never happened. It's a miracle. But the religious leaders are so concerned with the rules, the regulation, that they, they tell this man, they say, why should we listen to you? You were born in utter sin. Wow. That's what you come to church to hear, right? That's rough. So they, and it, then it says they sent this man away. This man had just had the greatest miracle of his life, and they, and they just send him away because they're more concerned about the rules. And Jesus is saying, look, I'm not like the bad religious ruler or leader. I'm not like poor religion that doesn't care for you but only cares about the rules. I care for you personally. I want to give you a full life. And so that's why Jesus starts giving this analogy in Scripture. In chapter 10, it's a response to what happened in chapter 9. And this kind of love from Jesus is manifested in the church. It's it's life that's full with Jesus, and it's full in his church. And this is one of the reasons that it's so important that we would be in church together, worshiping Jesus, loving Jesus, reaching those who don't know Jesus. I mean, this is what Sunday morning is all about, coming to worship together and to tell other people about Jesus. That's, that's why we're here on a Sunday morning. It's also why we come on a Sunday night to the call so that we can lift our prayers to Jesus Christ. I mean, of all the things that can make your life full, how many of them can listen to and answer your prayers? I mean, money can't answer your prayers. Your, your retirement package can't answer your prayers. Your great job can't answer your prayers. That, that idol couldn't answer your prayers. Nothing could but Jesus Christ. He hears our prayers. I mean, amen, what an amazing God, right? That we can lift up our prayers to him, that he hears us and he listens and he wants to do good to us. What an amazing God that we serve. Amen. He loves us, and we love him, and we want to spend time lifting up his name and being in his presence. And listen, we can't say that we love Jesus, but we don't love the church. Have you ever heard someone say that? Yeah, I, 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 I'm good. I love Jesus. I'm just not a fan of the church. I mean, Jesus compares the church in Scripture to a bride. In fact, to his bride. And there's some personal connection there. Saying that you love Jesus, but don't love the church, is like saying, Pastor Matt, I love you. You're a great guy. Your wife, not my favorite. You know? Don't love Sarah so much, but I think you're all right. At the end of the day, you and me are not friends. I just want to let you know (laughs) if that's the case. Not happening. And that's the same thing when we say, oh, I love Jesus. I don't really love the church, though. I mean, I, I don't know how Jesus is thinking it exactly, but I mean, just put those words in. Not so much my friend. Look, there's no perfect church because there's no perfect people. And I once worked for a pastor that said, if you find the perfect church, leave, because you're going to mess it up. Uh, (laughs) But the Bible says that Jesus is working on his church so that she would be presented without spot or blemish. And we may not be there yet, but that's what we're trying to do. I mean, that's our goal as a pastoral staff at Bethel Church, that we would keep getting better as a church, that we would keep presenting ourselves to Jesus Christ as better and better and closer to him, as better disciples, as better servants. And so we're, we're trying to get there. Jesus is the lover of our soul, Scripture says. Man, we love him. We love his church. And I want to tell you today emphatically and definitely that Jesus loves you. This, this may be one of the reasons that God got you out of bed and got you here this morning. Maybe you haven't heard it recently. Maybe someone hasn't told you. I want to tell you first, look, as a staff, as a pastor, we and I love you. And Jesus loves you. In fact, Scripture tells us, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but would have eternal life. That's true love. And if you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ today, you're going to have an opportunity in just a moment, just a few moments, 
we're going to spend some time getting closer to Jesus. The fullest life is one that is loved by God and is lived by one who loves God. Let me give you a second thought. Life is full on with each other. Let me show you something that happened when the church of Jesus Christ first began, all right? Acts 2, 46. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So immediately after Jesus pours out his Holy Spirit at Pentecost, Christians start happening. People start accepting Jesus Christ and giving their lives over to him, and it's happening by the thousands. And it says that day by day, they met in the temple courts. Let's call that big church, all right? And then they also met house to house, and we will call that life groups. One of the telltale signs that a life is full on for Christians is that we do life together. And so today, as part of Life Together at Bethel Church, we are going to launch into our brand new life groups. And before I give you some more details on that, I want you to watch a story from some people in this church, from Jason and Courtney's story. Hello, I'm Jason, and this is Courtney Moline, and this is our journey to starting a life group. Our journey started when we came to Bethel. Uh, We were attending a small church, and we pulled into the parking lot, and a whole overwhelming feeling came of how big this church could be and maybe not being able to get plugged in. And we walked in and I had hesitation. And after the service, I met Pastor George and Adine. And they really came to me and encouraged us to attend the Young Marrieds class to try to get plugged in. I remember walking in and thinking, this is kind of funny, this is a little off, but uh, they were just rolling out the Young Marrieds class that morning. And so right after service, we went over and we got to meet Pastor George and Adina, and we talked to them a little bit, but there was an instant connection and we, we were able to keep coming every week. And it was, um, it was the beginning of a really cool uh, a transition period for us. But we still didn't feel like we were connected on that personal level. Jason said that he could never really feel himself getting connected at Bethel. He said he, could, he didn't see himself as fitting in. And I was like, well, okay, you know, like if that's how it is and if it's just gonna be Sunday mornings, as long as we have the relationship with the Lord, that's what matters, right? He started getting connected with some of the um, other gentlemen and, and they fed into his life. There was motorcycle rides and he'd go off on those things and I'd get to go every now and then, you know, but uh, those personal relationships are what really made the difference in our marriage, in our, our lives. To be honest, that's what really connected to me is the motorcycle. And these guys invested in me and we did life together, just like life groups. We were on shoulder to shoulder riding. We were going out to lunch. We were um, going out just to coffee, hanging out at each other's houses, right? Just really enjoying each other. And that's what really helped me. And it was because these guys did life with me and helped me. And if I didn't do life with them and left, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now, something that is awesome. I love doing every day. And um, it's all about doing life with each other. And so I'm very excited for this next season because we're starting a life group. And we have a great couple that's gonna partner up with us. And our focus is to hit young families that we could do life together. And our kids grow together. And we're really excited to help with this, this opportunity to help Bethel Church grow younger couples and but just ultimately doing life together. Personally, I don't always get a chance to go out and have a lunch with a bunch of people. So I'm extremely excited about doing life groups, especially this particular one, because this means that we're gonna have people in our home that we're gonna be able to connect with. Opportunity to connect with these people for my kids to be ex- connected to. That's one of the biggest things for me. Um, there will be food. It probably won't all be by me, which is gonna be a good thing. Not the best of cooks, but uh, there will be food and there will be lots of fun, and I know my kids are looking forward to it, which is, makes all the big difference for me. All right. I want you to see that what really connected this amazing family to Bethel Church and fostered their growth as disciples of Christ was a personal relationship with other people in a group together. And it's a funny thing about sheep, they don't do super well 
when they're on their own. In fact, they suffer when they're alone. And they thrive when they're together. And as God's people, uh, really the same is true of us. We're simply better together. And in life groups at Bethel Church, we're going to do life together. So at Bethel, life groups are how we live in community with each other. This is how we have genuine relationship with each other, not just a, a pass by hello or, um, you know, it's great when we reunite on a Sunday morning, we shake hands, we give hugs, but we need more time, right? We need more time to have genuine relationships with each other, to go through life together, to have real and, and not superficial relationships. And we want you to thrive in a life group in a way that fits the rhythms and the passions of your life. And here's what I mean by that. Uh, we're organizing life groups into rhythms of life that make sense for us in the South Bay. So uh, we have semesters of life group, right? One starts here in September. So next week, some life groups are starting, and some are already going right now. They'll go through into November, almost December. We'll take a little break in the holidays. And then at the start of the year, we'll start some more. We'll take a break in May and have a short semester in the summer. So we're going to make some rhythms so that it seems to make sense with our busy and our up and down times in life. And then with your passions. So life groups uh, are moving. Some of you went to home groups in the past. And we're really taking uh, uh, them a step further where they're not just in one place doing the same thing at the same time every week, but the sky is kind of the limit now on the creativity of life groups and how you can be a part. You can be a part of a men's group, a women's group, a Bible study group, a next generation, so that's kind of youth and young adults. Uh, you can be a part of uh, an, a kind of like an adventure uh, type of group uh, for an activity group. We have all kinds of different ways that you can be in life groups. So you may have a passion, a bend, an affinity for something, and there's gonna be a life group for you. And I'll tell about this in a moment, but if there's not a life group for you yet, then you will have the opportunity to start one. So life groups are also where we experience growth. We live in community together in life groups, but we also experience growth in life groups. The most effective way for us to grow as disciples is to study the Bible and to discuss it together, to apply it to our lives. And no matter which life group you join, so whether you're at a coffee shop, whether you're in a home, whether you are at a restaurant on the way to work in the morning, whether you're doing uh, something that, there's a couple life groups starting here on Sunday afternoons after service, uh, wherever you are, you are going to have a chance to know the word, to study the word, to discuss the word, and to apply it to your lives. That's, that's important. So that standard will be held high for us in life groups, that the Bible will always be involved. And life groups are also how we find freedom. True spiritual freedom comes through prayer and open, honest interaction with one another. I think it's interesting that Scripture tells us to confess our sins to one another, to pray for one another, that you may be healed and restored. Part of God's restoration plan, his healing plan, his growth plan for us in our lives involves other people. It's not just to say, uh, Lord, I, I confess my sins to you, although we need to do that. That's in Scripture. But it also says to do it with one another, to confess our sins to one another. And there's healing and restoration involved there. So we want you to be doing life with each other in a way that is real. I mean, just think of your closest relationships, your best friendships you've had over your life, and all the good that that's done for you. That's the kind of connection that we want to create at Bethel Life Groups. And so let me just explain to you for a moment um, how to join a life group, how to be a part, okay? There's a couple different ways. One is that you can grab our Bethel app, all right? Uh, you can go to the app. If you don't have it, you can download it on Android or iOS. You can scroll down to the uh, life group section there in the app, and when you tap on it, it will give you all of the different life groups that we have, and you can sort them. You can sort them by men or women or all these different categories that we have for life groups. Another way you can do it is at home on a computer, a laptop, or a desktop. If you go to Bethel.org, then you'll find a life group page, and you can go to find a group or start a group, and from there you can get information about how to start one, or if you go to find a group, you'll see a list of all the groups that are available for you. You can also sort those so that you have an easier time finding what you're looking for. And let me say this, if you're looking at a group and you don't quite find one that fits you, maybe your timing, maybe your affinity, and you say, you know what? I'm going to start a group. Well, I say, that's awesome. You should start a group. We want to hear that more. Uh, you, you can start a group. And 
Some of you go, oh, right off the bat, I don't know, I don't have a big house, my parking is bad, I don't know that I'm really good at leading a group of people. We're not asking you to start another church, all right? We want you to have, please don't start another church for the record. <laughs> we want you, though, to be able to start a life group that makes sense for you. And so we're going to ask you to do a couple things. If you say, yeah, I want to start a life group. Well, one, we want you to go to Grow Track, okay? Anyone that starts a life group is going to go to Grow Track, and you can do that starting in October. And then we're going to have a life group leader training. Those will happen periodically through the year. The next one is in two weeks, September 16th. All right, I guess it's almost three weeks. September 16th, and we'll do that right behind us here in Lee Hall, and we'll train you. We'll give you all the equipping you need to start a group. We'll help you make the group. We'll help you and resource you in getting the word out about your group, and we'll give you resources on what to do in your group as well. Look, do you, do you want to grow closer in your relationship with Jesus Christ? Yes, all right, got a few yeses there, good, I hope that's the case. Do you have a friend? Yes, all right. If you don't have a friend, then you, you come up here after service or meet me in the lobby, and Pastor Robin will be your friend, all right? <laughs> no, I, I will be your friend too, all right? Uh, but here's the point, though. If you want to grow closer to the Lord and you have a friend, you can start a life group. It's that simple. You don't need a theology degree. You don't have to be an amazing teacher. You just have to want to know the Lord more, have a, have a desire to grow in God. And have a friend. Two people is a life group. It'll be a little bigger than that. That's okay. But just get started somewhere. Join a life group today. Start a life group today. We hope that's the case for everyone in the church. And that's our vision at the church, that everyone would be in a life group. Every single person. So whether you join one or you start one, remember, Scripture makes it clear that a crucial part of us growing together as Christians is to do life together. So let me conclude with this third and, and final thought that life is full on for one another. So yes, with each other, thus the importance of life groups, but also for one another. I want to close today with a thought about the life abundant that Jesus wants for us. And you need to know that coming to church is not just about you. And maybe some of you are like, I was with you until that moment, Matt, and now you're not my friend anymore. But it's true. Church is not just about you, all right? It, it's not about you being fed. Although you will be fed every time you come to this church because we will open the word and we will preach the truth from the Bible. You can guarantee that that's gonna happen every time you come here. But it's not just about being fed. And it's not about being comfortable. Although our seats do have like three inches of foam cushion, so I'm just saying, all right, that it's, it, it's pretty cush where you're sitting right now. But it's not just about being comfortable. And it's not about putting your card in the time clock and punching your Sunday card, right? Like, oh, yep, I came to church this week. Good Christian, you know? I, I did it. I went to the nice building, and I sat there, and I, I raised one hand, and, and I gave him the offering. It's not just about punching the Sunday clock. Although we love when you're here every Sunday. We love you being in this great building with us. Being a part of the church of Christ also means that we serve one another. And when talking about the full life in freedom that we get with Jesus Christ, Paul said this in Galatians, chapter 5, verse 13. It is absolutely clear that God has called you to a free life. Just make sure that you don't use this freedom as an excuse to do whatever you want and to destroy your freedom. Rather, use your freedom to serve one another in love. That's how freedom grows. For everything we know about God's word is summed up in a single sentence. Love others as you love yourself. This is one of the main reasons we have dream teams here at Bethel Church, so that each person has an opportunity to serve one another as we tell the world about Jesus Christ. Could we run this church as a staff with no volunteer help? Could we run the kids' dream team? Could we run the youth dream team? Could we run the ushers, the greeters, the hospitality team? Could we run the coffee shop with no dream team and everyone said amen to coffee? Amen. Well, the answer is no, not the way it needs to go, but I'll tell you this, even if we could, as the staff of this church, even if we could run it, we never would because it would rob you of one of the joys of the fullness of life in Jesus Christ. 
And if you serve already, you know this. I don't know, maybe preaching to the choir to a few of you. You know the joy of serving, but you may just come here week in and week out, and, and that part of your life might be missing. And I would really like to challenge you today. I'd like to exhort you today to consider and to be a part, to serve with us at Bethel Church. I want to implore you to join GrowTrack, to come through GrowTrack with us starting in October so you can learn how to make a difference in the lives of others. You'll find a special fulfillment in life when you serve. It's part of the fullness. The good shepherd takes care of the sheep, and the sheep in turn can take care of each other. Church, let's conclude today with commitment and passion in our hearts to live the life that Jesus has intended for us, a life that is full on. Say it with me one more time. It's full on. Would you bow your heads with me and let's pray. As we bow our heads and close our eyes, I want to point out to you that later in this passage, Jesus says that he has other sheep that are not in this fold. And what he's saying there is that there are more people than just the disciples listening in that crowd at the time. There were not just Jewish people that needed to hear the message, but there were also Gentiles. In other words, everybody else. That Jesus wants to know, that Jesus wanted to call his own and be the good shepherd for. And you know what? This is still true today. You may not know Jesus, but he wants to know you. And remember Jesus' contrast between those who don't love the sheep and himself who truly loves the sheep. One of the biggest ideas in this passage with that contrast is so that you get a picture of how much God loves you, cares for you, protects you, and is always on your side. And because when you start to understand that, you start to trust God and allow him to enter your life and lead your life. And before we make life better in a life group, before we serve each other in a dream team, each one of us has to make sure that we have life with Jesus Christ. And so today, in just a moment, I'm gonna pray a prayer and ask you as a whole church just to repeat that prayer with me. And the reason we're gonna do that is because scripture tells us that if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, that he died on a cross, that he rose from the grave, that we will be saved. There's a belief in our heart and a confession with our mouth. And scripture tells us that's the process by which we are saved when we accept Jesus as our savior. And so today you may be saying, yeah, Matt, um, I like what you're talking about. I want life to the full. I want full on life. And I don't have that yet with Jesus Christ. Then I, want, I hope you'll say this prayer and you'll mean it in your heart. And maybe you've walked away from Jesus Christ. You no longer are in the fold with the good shepherd, but you want to be again. And you could say this prayer too and, and rededicate your life to the Lord. And in that moment, there will be instant life change. You will be saved today. The greatest thing that can happen to any one of us in our lives is to have salvation with Jesus Christ. And so let's pray. Would you pray this prayer with me, church? And if you're praying it for the first time or rededicating, pray it, all right? And, and know the Lord, the good shepherd today. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for your love. Thank you for loving me first. And thank you for your sacrifice for me. I believe that you lived a perfect life. I believe that you died on a cross. I believe that you rose from the grave. And I believe that if I confess my sin to you today, that you will forgive me. I'm sorry for what I have done, Lord. Will you forgive me? Will you give me eternal life? And will you give me full life now? I look forward to loving and living a life with you.